Well, I'd like to introduce the last panel of the day for the Evidence to Action event. Uh, this is the last panel for this event, uh, but it's the first session of an event that's carrying on to tomorrow, which is about community voices. So as well as uh, all of you people gathered here today that have been participating in the day's events here, uh, we've got uh, an additional 20 or so community representatives from around the world to add to the community representatives that are already here that have come to London to participate in a Community Voices event tomorrow. So I'm really pleased uh, that this panel is, is the way of bringing these two events together, both in this media panel and in the networking session that we will have immediately after this. Uh, Keith will introduce the panel, but, but the idea is you know, for us to hear from the media about reporting on IWT and the role of research and academics in feeding into that. But I think it's also important to, you know, as we discussed this morning, to emphasize the role of communities and the local knowledge that they have, and you know, which can also make for good stories and be an important thing for the media to be aware of when they're reporting on IWT. So community is a great source of first-hand knowledge of what's going on on the ground that can be included in those stories. So I won't say anything more other than to welcome the remaining community representatives and to thank the Evidence to Action event for you know, organising this final session with us as a, as a joint session between our, our two events. And I really hope in the networking session after this that um, we really do get a chance to mingle and that you know, researchers can talk to media people, can talk to community people, and, and uh, we can really share different experiences and perspectives on tackling IWT. Okay, so with those few words, I'll hand over to Keith. Hi, I'm Keith Somerville uh, from Centre of Journalism at the University of Kent and a member of DICE, the Durrell Institute. Uh, it's, it's possibly rather appropriate, and I'm going to use an expression that is either incredibly appropriate or incredibly in bad taste about my role, and that is having been a career journalist and a part-time academic while I was that. I'm now more a full-time academic and a little bit of a journalist, and I pick apart journalism. So I really am a poacher turned gamekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> we have a very, very strong panel, a very interesting panel. Estacio Valoy, an investigative journalist, working some of the time with the Environmental Investigation Unit, Oxpeckers particularly on issues like biodiversity, timber, ivory, rhino home politics, and economic problems in sub-Saharan Africa. Rachel Bale of the National Geographic Society, wildlife trade investigative reporter, reporting on wildlife crime and exploitation for the series Wildlife Watch and for National Geographic magazine and various other things. And Jonathan Watts, the global environment editor of The Guardian, former Latin America reporter and Asia environment correspondent. For the past decade, he's focused on climate and biodiversity, a co-founder of the China Environmental Press Awards and a lead writer for The Guardian's Environmental Defenders Project. And again, many other things. Uh, there we, oh, I caught it. <laughs> that was very clever. I'd never be able to do that again. Uh, there are various issues I think we need to try to address. Each will talk for about 10 minutes to leave us time at the end. But some of the issues I'd like, if possible, to be brought up are the need for a constructive relationship between the media, researchers, policymakers, and NGOs that is evidence-based. Making clear the difference between evidence-based stories and those based on campaigning and advocacy. Because sometimes I think they merge and it doesn't lead to clarity. Also, identifying and not being dragged in by, and I'll use the, the word of the moment, though I think propaganda is a better one, fake or exaggerated narratives. Like, for example, the Al-Shabaab and now the Boko Haram ivory terrorism narrative, which is full of holes, but too often still dominates. And finally, I think one thing that is very important is about representation in stories. 
the framing and perspective of news about the illegal wildlife trade and conservation that frequently excludes or ignores local communities, rural livelihoods, gender and human rights issues at the expense of perhaps Western generated narratives or narratives that editors think will appeal to Western audiences. Case in point, this week's coverage in the Express of the role of British troops in Malawi, which has been really just PR and nothing else. But I'll now hand over first to Estacio. Hello, all. Um, so I'm a little bit uh, like a zombie. <laughs> it was a really long trip. Even my voice already gone. Uh, I'll try to come with this presentation in a simple way. Uh, we've been tackled the poaching issue uh, in a different ways. For rhinos, elephant, pangoli, lions, and so on. From South Africa all the way to Tanzania and uh, in general, Southern Africa. Uh, we were able to meet some of the main poachers, if we talk about Massinger. For Nyimpine, uh, Paolo, we sat with them, we discussed with them. I'm talking about Massinger, a place where uh, you don't have easy access. You start asking about poaching, they shoot you. Uh, as I was saying, we start this long time ago, many years, perhaps more than 12. But after looking to the poaching issue, which in, in my viewpoint I consider it uh, not as an environmental crime, but as a crime like any other crime. Uh, that's what I was saying in the morning. If these people commit crime in this or that count, we have to extradite them. The piece which I'm going to show you now is about uh, Kruger borderland uh, conflicts, uh, where under the name of conservation, all the game hunters involving uh, uh, local politicians and uh, foreign might nationals such as uh, Twin Seeds end up grabbing land, uh, land from those locals. I'm talking about 90% of the land which belongs <coughs> to Twin Seeds and uh, um, Limpopo uh, National Park. Since the governor or the former governor in uh, uh, Massinger, or in Gaza, in Gaza province, because Massinger belongs to Gaza, came to the community and I did promise them to involve all the people on an ecotourism uh, development uh, um, uh, project. The community did, did give uh, to the government, uh, or to the governor, uh, 10 hectares first, then second, he did acquire plus 10 hectares of land. Then later on, he decided that it uh, was not good enough. He went back to try to grab the 3,000 uh, 3, uh, extension of land. Then uh, leaving the community apart with nothing to live with. That's the place where the community used to uh, practice agriculture. Uh, to feed the cows, because Masinji, the main activities in Masinji are exactly agriculture and the raising cows. Uh, what happened here is after we investigate all this process of poaching, we decide to look to the social, economic, cultural side of those communities. Why those communities were keeping uh, involved in poaching, and why these communities were crying every day. And we realized that uh, all these game hunters, which were supposed to employ the community people, all those game, game hunters and the governor, which were supposed to ask the community what does the community want for their own development, this was never held. And a part of it, uh, as I did mention before, the 90% of the land was taken. One of the questions was, if we have no land, what are we going to do here? in our own land. This process involved corruption where the former Gaza uh, governor, the administrator, they even tried to bribe the community so the community could sell the 3,000 
uh, hectares of land to the multinational company called the Twin City, which is a, one of the biggest company. And there was not only Twin City which was involved in this process. Uh, we had uh, South Africa sugarcane companies, which also are in Masinji, or were in Masinji, let's say in this way, were in Masinji. We have, uh, as I said, the National Park, which at certain time uh, decide to allocate the people or to remove the people from inside the, the National Park. The question was, we are going to remove these people. Yes. What kind of benefits will come for these people? They start constructing under the resettlement process uh, houses type two, type two, or with two rooms. If you look to the uh, way of living in Masinji, we'll find out that each male end up with uh, five women. And it's not possible to have all those five women in one house with two rooms. This was the first thing. In terms, in the economical terms, these people had no benefits. Nobody was working there. The multinationals were keeping, occupying the land and they making a lot of money. And they even said, no, we're here to protect here because we have many poachers in Masinji. But meanwhile, these uh, game conservation were also involved in poaching. We, at the end of the day, had to involve uh, demilitarization uh, process in order to remove all the communities because they say that the communities were the ones involved in poaching. But in fact, this was not the aim. The aim was to occupy all that land. So what the people did exactly was to go against all these companies. But because the general, the governor, uh, the administrator were all involved, it was difficult. One of the beautiful things, after we finished reporting uh, or published this report, uh, three months later, we realized that uh, the company did construct defense because the community were claiming about defense uh, because lions and hyenas, they were crossing from the game hunters and they were killing the community's cattle, which we're talking about 1,000 cattle. Uh, at the same time, we realized that uh, the community today uh, was given a, a right to use the land uh, so they can come with the ecotourism, uh, let's say, reserve. And uh, one minute. Oh, <laughs> I speak too much. Anyway. Uh, <coughs> so my aim here is to be focused on the community. What were the gains of this community after all the community were being displaced and the 90% of the land was taken by uh, the governor and uh, his friends. Cecil, thank you very much. <laughs> it demonstrates the importance of looking at communities when we're looking at why illegal wildlife trade happens and the, the cost to communities as well as to wildlife. Rachel, hand over to you now. Okay. So real quick, Keith already introduced me, but um, for those of you who aren't familiar, I'm a reporter for Wildlife Watch, which is National Geographic's um, investigative reporting unit, which focuses on wildlife crime and exploitation. So we cover not just um, wildlife crime, things that are illegal, but also issues that um, are legal but could potentially be problematic for wildlife. Just so you guys have a little bit of insight into what it's like reporting on wildlife crime or the illegal wildlife trade specifically, I just wanted to give you a little background. Um, and I think a lot of this is true for non-journalists as well. But um, some of the most practical challenges, um, small or no travel budgets, which means sometimes it is hard for us um, who don't work in the communities that we're reporting on to actually get to know how these issues, both conservation and crime, affect the local communities. Similarly, language barriers, time zone differences, especially when we're working on deadline, can be a big challenge. Um, and 
<laughs> journalists always have to throw this out, protective PR teams can always be a challenge as well. But bigger picture, conceptually, one of the hardest things is trying to show readers why they should care about these stories and how to make, this, how to make the stories feel real to them. We can you know, jolt them into reality by showing a graphic video or a photo or something like that. But at the same time, we have to be careful about not going too far down that line because it can turn the public off to these stories in general. Um, we need them to actually read through the entire story and get the information as opposed to, you know, just plugging their ears and saying, this is too depressing, I can't read it. So striking that balance, how do we leave readers not feeling helpless, but instead um, inspired or angry enough to actually get involved. Um, similarly, uh, this was discussed earlier today, but getting sources to talk about sensitive subjects, for example, when um, researchers feel like they need to self-censor because it can you know, potentially put their work funding or their um, work status at risk. And as Keith mentioned, understanding a source's motivation in why they've decided to talk to us. Um, what do they get out of talking to us? That's something, you know, no matter how pure your intentions, the reporter is going to um, critically think about. Lastly, these issues are so complicated. They're so complex with so many nuances and so many different stakeholders. Trying to tell these stories and to work in all of these complexities um, in an article that is still engaging and that readers still want to read is really hard. Um, so how do we decide what species and what issues we're going to cover? First, of course, we look, you know, is it a good story? Um, is it an important subject and do we have the resources to cover it? And if all of that is a yes, then at least the way I work is I look at these four criteria. Does it fit our mission statement? Um, Wildlife Watch has a very specific mission statement about shining a light on commercial scale exploitation of wildlife, um, identifying weaknesses in national and international efforts to protect wildlife, and empowering institutions and individuals working for a better world. Secondly, we always ask ourselves, can we add something to this conversation? Because I spend pretty much all of my time reporting on wildlife, um, if I see that a particular story has already been covered broadly in other media, I'm probably not going to focus on it too much unless I feel like I have something unique to add, new information, or um, some sort of insider analysis that readers couldn't get anywhere else. Third is their potential for impact. Um, again, this is sort of part of our mission statement. We're doing these stories because we want to make a difference. And if it's a story that that we don't think will really matter, then I don't know, why spend our time on it? I mean, I know not every story is going to change the world, but still, if, if we think it's a story that can change one person's mind or you know, a policy, big level, we'll, we'll give it a try. Lastly, we have um, four predefined areas of focus that we try to hit. Those include um, covering species that don't get a lot of media attention, uh, covering research and work on demand reduction and focusing on uh, technological solutions that combat the illegal wildlife trade. This is obviously, you know, we do a lot of work that doesn't hit those um, specific areas, but that's something we are always on the lookout for. So to give a couple examples, um, this story about the illegal trade in orchids is something that's not regularly covered by the media. And I actually hadn't even considered doing this story until I met Dr. Phelps and um, Dr. Hinsley at an event last year in Oxford. I was immediately interested because I myself hadn't read anything um, in the media about this. It had the potential for really great photos, which is important for National Geographic. And um, Jacob and Amy were really enthusiastic. <laughs> um, I think this is a really good example of how researchers in the media can work together because I do my best to keep up with what's going on in this field, but my beat covers the entire world and all of the species in it. So when our researchers are particularly enthusiastic about something, I'm a lot more likely to pay attention. 
Um, a second example of bridging the gap between advocates in the media is this story we published a couple of weeks ago by a reporter who works regularly for us named Rachel Neuer. This was a story we selected because, again, Japan's role in the illegal ivory trade is something that hasn't gotten a lot of attention in the media. And we also selected it for its potential to have impact. This ran just before the CITES um, standing committee, and we knew this was a discussion people were likely to be having. So one of the things in talking about you know, how we separate what is real evidence versus what is um, massaged data, um, I, I was talking to Rachel about how she did this. And um, because one of the main characters and main sources for this story was a man named Masayuki Sakamoto. He's an advocate and he's an environmental lawyer. Um, <coughs> so Rachel had met him back in 2016, I think at the CITES COP, and they had spent a while just talking. She wasn't working on anything in particular, but they got to know each other and you know, start building trust. Um, she spoke to all of his, well, not all of his critics, but she spoke to some of his biggest critics, and she was able to gauge by talking to him that nobody actually had you know, any real information that contradicted his claims. And lastly, a lot of NGOs, had, NGOs and academics had substantiated the claims he was making. So once you've done, the, once you've done this job long enough, you get a pretty good BS meter, I guess. I don't know how else to phrase that. But um, uh, the, the last thing Rachel told me was that she just didn't, you know, she got the sense that, that this was for real. So all of those things combined is sort of what led to this relationship leading to a real story and being able to figure out, you know, what was actually the real data underlying it. The third thing I'll mention real quick is this story about the illegal trade in hummingbirds from Mexico to the U.S. We selected this story because hummingbirds is another um, group of animals that isn't often discussed in terms of illegal wildlife trade, and we hadn't seen it reported elsewhere. So we knew by doing this story, we would be able to provide readers with um, something new. So when we sit down to do a story, we often start by looking at all of the published journal articles we can find on a particular issue. Oh, goodness. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know what? I'm going to skip this one because I want to go to this last slide. Um, this is about, um, because this panel is in part about how the media researchers and advocates can have constructive relationships, I think one of the most important things is building personal relationships. Events like this, even though they're, you know, can be uncomfortable for those of us that are introverts, are really important. Meeting face-to-face -face is critical. Um, Second, this gives us a chance to understand each other's points of view. I need to remember that researchers are you know, teaching classes, going into the field, trying to hit their own deadlines, just as I need you know, people I come to as sources to understand the reason I'm emailing them once a day, three days in a row, is because I'm on my own deadline and think your voice is important to this story. Um, Lastly, it feels kind of silly to put this on there, but um, be nice, I've got a good story about this later, come find me afterwards um, <laughs> about how this can shoot you in the foot. But it's easy to forget. I mean, this means, you know, I won't get frustrated when you don't have time to do an interview, and you won't get frustrated when I ask you to explain for the fifth time how something works, because it's my job to represent the readers, and that means making sure we understand something inside and out. We are trying to get it right. I am not trying to misunderstand or get anything twisted on purpose. And if you think um, you know, I or any other reporter is approaching a story in a misguided way, we want to know about it. We really do. Help us understand why. We might not always agree, and we might not always take your advice, but we really do want to get it right, and we need your help to do that. So if you have uh, story ideas, feedback, thoughts, anything, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, uh, Keith. And um, it's great to be here. Um, it's a great talk by Rachel, who, who covered a lot of the ground I was going to cover on um, journalistic ethics and motives. Um, and it's always frustrating being with a, not quite a rival, but close enough 
because I was I was here at an earlier session and and there was um, what, what was the gentleman's name? Let me just check. Uh, there, David Robert, who was here and he he was talking about orchids and I was like, wow, there's a story there. There's a story there. And I I collared him afterwards and said, well, what's the latest on orchids? Might there be a story there? And I was you know thinking there might be something that I could do before anyone else. But of course. <laughs> National Geographic are there first. Oh, well. Um, you beat us on plenty of good stuff. <laughs> um, I'm going to be slightly contrarian um, in that I know this is all about being evidence-based and data and research and getting away from sensationalist um, fake news or that sort of thing. But I, I, I want to stress that if... The title of this session is Bridging the Gap Between Researchers, Communities and the Media. Um, I think the best way to bridge the gap is with is, is, is emotion. Um, the, none of us are here for, because we like data. We're here because we care. Oh. <laughs> oh. Okay, I misjudged my audience here. All right. None of us started looking at that data just because we like numbers? Okay. Oh, God. All right, all right. But there must have been some emotional connection that got even the geekiest geek and the nerdiest nerd uh, interested in whatever their subject is. And basically what, I'm, what I want to stress is that we can have powerful communication um, with emotion and at the same time with bloody reliable numbers and data and good information and fact checking and all those things that we uh, all care about and that are becoming increase increasingly threatened uh, in, the, in the current age. Um, so I, you know, I, I, before I forget, just two really basic things that as a journalist I wish the research community um, and NGOs as well could do, and some of you already do very well do this, but just not always. Um, one is, just to remember, if, if, if you can get more advanced time for journalists to look at the findings before they come out, usually there is quite a lot because um, graphics are so important now and it takes time to build these beautiful graphics that our teams can do. And secondly, to, to, be, to really be open, anyone doing investigations, if journalists can be there early on and join that investigation through different phases, um, then you know, we really feel we've got something exclusive, we can really make it personal and human, um, and, and it costs a lot. I think Rachel's point was well said, um, and, and uh, I, I'm grateful that I work for a publication that does allow me uh, to, to get out and about and see things on the ground, because you know, stressing about emotion or empathy or whatever you want to call it, um, the crucial thing is to, to go to those communities yourself. It's the researchers, it's the NGOs, it's the investigators um, who give the tips. We, we kind of rely on you to connect us to what's going on at the community level or, or, or on the ground level. Um, and then uh, we can either write it up as a science paper from distance or what I've always tried to do is to... Um, to go, because I think um, one thing, I, I've been a journalist for 22 years, my goodness, uh, and um, one thing that I, I never ever forget is that no story is, turns out to be what you expect it to be. So whatever data you've had, whatever tips you've had, when you go to the ground you'll see exceptions, you'll see different reasons why that data's uh, existed, and most of all you'll have this human face uh, and things don't always turn out um, uh, as expected, as I said. So, I mean, just a, a, a few examples of, of different sort of wildlife trafficking stories that have shown this to me over the years. I'll, I'll very, I, won't, I won't tell a long anecdote, but just kind of just to run through a few of them. One, one of the first ones I went on um, was when I was based in China, but covering Asia. Um, and I went to look at um, uh, tigers, um, and, and tiger poaching in Thailand, and we went with a group of rangers, and I would, you know, they, we had one day of training, and they were there with their guns and running and doing exercises, and it was all very military, and it, 
you know, like some kind of um, army exercise. It was almost an army exercise. And I was thinking, wow, these poachers, um, it's going to be a bit scary uh, when we get on the ground and we, we agreed to go on a night patrol and, and we had hammocks and we were going to camp in the forest and, uh, and, and, you know, everyone was there with their guns like this the whole time. It was, it was kind of propaganda, but at the same time, there had been some trouble, so it wasn't completely uh, unvalidated. Anyway, you know, after two or three hours of this, um, suddenly it was like, quiet, there's a poacher coming. And they were all taking positions, and I was trying to find the thickest tree I could find in case there was a firefight and I could get behind it. Um, and well, <laughs> some guy comes wandering along the road with uh, a little... A little a bag full of something, I couldn't really see what it was, and they surrounded him, and he looked absolutely terrified. Um, and he, ha he had a bag full of rosewood, and it was illegal, and you know the, 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 the rangers were able to say, look, we, we had a success, we're gonna arrest this guy. Um, but I, re I remember sort of going home, or going back to my hotel, and just thinking, wow, that, that I feel most sorry for this poor guy, who's obviously just a poor local, guy trying to make a living and maybe I'm looking at the wrong end of the story and I should focus more on consumers or, or middlemen. Um, so, you know, but to, just going back to emotion, you know, the, the emotion there is, 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 you know, is obviously the sympathy and understanding and the, and the reaction of policymakers should be development uh, and education. And then in, at the level of the middlemen, I think this is where, you know, the, the emotion is much more about anger and outrage and it, it, it's people who knowingly most of the time do illegal activities to make a lot of money it's often organized as we we've heard today and um and 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 sometimes the the danger is that you create a culture where it's considered okay or or people just ignore it and this is very dangerous and one example there was in in china and so many of these stories go back to china because it's such a big, a big source of demand for many different types of wildlife, of course. Um, but I, I was given a tip-off again by uh, some NGOs, some researchers, um, that there would be a, a, an auction of tiger bone wine in the Kunlun Hotel in Beijing. Um, and I, you know, they said, why don't you go and have a look? And you know, I went thinking I would be a journalist and ended up becoming an activist uh, because once I asked a question and said, I'm a journalist, um, they asked me to leave and I refused and I sat silently. And then one security guard came and sat next to me and then another security guard came and sat next to me and I was actually starting to shake. But I thought the fact that they haven't thrown me out shows that they're more worried than I am. And eventually they closed down the, the whole auction um, because they, they didn't want the fuss. I mean, I'm sure they sold it elsewhere. It didn't achieve anything. Um, but I mean, the, the emotion, I mean, it did achieve something in the short term, and it also meant that that Kunlun Hotel will think twice about staging those sorts of events. Um, but I mean, there is that, that side of, you know, that, that side of emotion. And then, I, I, obviously, um, when it comes to buyers here, consumers, you have to look at that too, and there the emotion is more guilt or regret or even fear. You know, why should people care. Yes, it's beautiful. Yes, we love it. That's a strong emotion that you must consider. Fear is another one. I mean, why when, when all these insects are di disappearing, all these other species are disappearing, you have to connect it to people. Why does it matter, as we've heard already? And that's where the emotion comes in. Why does it matter in the end? Um, and that will connect to something raw, and that's emotional. And finally, I would say I would go to the stage of, 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 of you, know, you know, I've been involved in this Defenders series with, in collaboration with Global Witness. Um, and there you've come across um, some extraordinarily brave people. Some of them are rangers um, in Africa, and another guy, um, Bobby Chan, in the Philippines, who set up his own NGO. He's an environmental lawyer. Um, I will wind up very quickly. <laughs> um, uh, he set up his own NGO because he says the local government and police are corrupt. So he, he and his crew uh, go out and sort of intercept illegal fishing boats who drop cyanide in the water so that the fish come up, so that they can be scooped up 
uh, and sold to China for ornamental fish. And he intercepts them, though they have guns. He intercepts illegal loggers. Uh, and these sorts of stories are really strong and, and kind of putting a human face on things really helps audiences relate to them. And there the emotion obviously is much more about admiration or, or, or hero, you know, feelings of admiration for heroism. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is not that you shouldn't be any less scrupulous, not that you shouldn't put uh, a great many caveats on everything that you do, just for scientific rigor should never be challenged. Um, whatever investigation you're doing, at whatever level, whether you're NGOs, whether you're scientists, um, you know, that, 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 that's extraordinarily important. Um, but I would say think not just about bridging between um, communities, researchers and the media, you know, there's a, there's a progression. Think one step further, think of your audience, think who's this for. You know, that's kind of our job as media to do that, but these days you can do it directly, obviously with tweets and Facebook posts, or even when you're communicating your research or your investigation to journalists, really think, I mean, I'm sure you do already, but really think how to communicate the emotion of it. Why should the journalist get interested? Why, how will the journalist get an audience interested? It's not enough that it should be covered. Um, I, I, I've, I've done that in the past. Um, I, I had a Tony Witten, dearly, dearly passed away last year, uh, was always telling me, oh, you've got to do these, these unloved species and this insect and that snail. Um, and I really tried hard. Um, and I did a couple of stories, but you know, when you look at the traffic, very few people read them. Um, so we, we, you know, there is a way to do it, but you have to think about it much, much more. Anyway, what I'm saying is, um, this is a subject that is completely worth getting emotional about. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes, so we want to get in as many questions as we can. Try to be brief, because I'm sure there are going to be a lot of people out there with questions. I'll take a couple at a time, and if you want one particular member of the panel to answer this, make that very clear. So, okay, one there and one there. If we start with you, and can we have the, the microphone, please? Um, hi, Susan Chain from the IUCN Primate Specialist Group. Very quickly, how can we, as NGOs, and especially working in you know, the habitat countries where many of these animals come from, ensure that when journalists come, they don't just speak to the white person? Second question, how can we also ensure that when we are telling these stories passionately, that we're not taken out of context and where our, our stories and what we're doing are at best muddied and at worst, we're actually totally misrepresented through the editing process. Because I completely agree that we definitely, do, I can talk about gibbons literally until the cows come home. <laughs> but we, it's, it's, and we need to bridge this gap. But I think we could do with your advice as to how to get around those problems. Thank you. And, yeah, Jeremy Apple, uh, formerly of the UK government and uh, now an independent advisor and consultant. Um, my question to all the journalists is, do you think it's your role in tackling wildlife crime stories to preach to the converted or to the unconverted? Okay. Uh, that should have been on my list of challenges. <laughs> Who would like to start? I have a couple, I have a couple okay. thoughts. <laughs> um, let's see. So to the question about preaching to the converted, that should have been on my list of um, challenges because we do want... I, well, I don't want to speak for everybody, but... I think, um, you know, journalists are trying to make a difference in our own way, and if we're just preaching to the choir, nothing's getting done. As far as reaching people who aren't in the choir, I think that gets to this issue of finding the emotion in the stories. But I'll let you talk more about that. Um, to your other questions about how do we make sure we don't just talk to the white person, I, um, I try really hard. But um, that is where I think researchers and people who are in the field can be really helpful because when I show up somewhere new, I don't necessarily 
know how to get into the local communities. I need an introduction. So for people who are working in the field, if you can make those introductions, that is hugely helpful. And real quick, as far as misrepresentation, you can always ask for a fact check. Um, and in fact, I recommend doing that. Just say, I'll talk to you, but please, you know, give me a call and fact check before you run your story. Um, to be honest, we don't always have time for that. So if you explicitly ask for that, we will make time. Cecilia, how do, how do you find it engaging mm -hmm. with the local communities rather than just perhaps going to officials and experts? I mean, uh, one of the main things is uh, in this profession, it's forbidden to create facts. You create facts, end up being swayed, end up uh, being detained, being shot, depends. Uh, it's really important when we're going to the ground to have a link within the community. Every time I go to the ground, I live with the community. I sleep with them, I go approaching with them, those which are approaches, and uh, I live with them in general. So I'm able to know exactly what kind of problem they're facing. And that the ones tell me exactly that uh, the governor or that poacher is involved. Uh, we paid that man yesterday. The police commander was paid yesterday. So we end up having all this kind of information. Uh, I mean, you end up not misrepresenting uh, the community or come with misrepresentation in your story. Otherwise, uh, you can write for your room, either from London or from China. You not have this emotional, this feeling, to know that how the people feel, how do they live exactly, why makes them be involved in this or that. I think this is the way uh, this should be done. And then looking to the non jewels this relation, uh, they come, they release reports, but uh, when you go to the fact check, you know, <coughs> if you compare it to what is happening on the ground, you end up finding different or several gaps. Because some of them, they never really be, uh, they never been there within the community. So uh, it's kind of trick also to have access to the community. Jonathan, how about the, the relevance issue? Um, how, how to make it more relevant to a wider audience? Um, well, that, 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 that is the, the biggest challenge of, 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 of journalism always. Um, one is prominence. Um, I, we, we have daily meetings at The Guardian where we discuss what are the stories and you, know, you, have, you have to fight for your stories because there's lots of, lots of competition. But if you can get um, like the big IPCC report on the front page and at the top of the website, um, you are going to reach a much wider audience. Um, then you have to do things like try to calibrate um, how much effort you're going to put into kind of appealing to people and using very dramatic and emotive words, and, and, uh, but at the same time staying within a, a boundary where you are on the, on the side of truth. You're not going too far, and that, that's, that's, that's what journalists do. That's a big part of what journalists do. Um, I, I, I think when it comes to... Um, just to just to go across some of the other points that were made, um, how can you protect? How can you prevent your comments being misquoted or muddied? Um, one thing you can do always is record um, what conversations are taken. If you're in the middle of the forest or, or the savanna, that's sometimes a bit weird. Um, and it kind of implies a lack of trust from the beginning, I guess, which you might not want to have. But uh, a good dialogue is important. Um, if there are mistakes at The Guardian, certainly we have a reader's, reader's editor where you can complain uh, or, or raise an issue or a factual issue. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that there is a, a degree where you have to trust the journalist, which is not always <laughs> end up with good results because journalists are humans and there's, there's, there's a whole range of, of, of people who, who are stress different things and have different values. So maybe it's important, even before you agree to someone coming, that you really, you check them up. What's their track record? How do they write? 
are they considered trustworthy? Maybe don't choose somebody who you don't know or whose articles you haven't read before. Um, uh, and then not speaking to um, a white person. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I try wherever possible to find local experts and local analysts, but I think to a degree, the fact I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm British and I work from a British newspaper, um, you know, a lot of the time it's British people or people in international institutions uh, who, who are the conduits, whether that's academic or, or global institutions. Um, I think that's it. Okay. Right, let's take a couple more. One and one right at the back there. So, Dillis? Yep, yep uh, Dillis Rowe, IAD. Um, what's the balance between proactive uh, searching for your own stories and responding reactively to pitches from researchers and the like? <laughs> So, Rachel, I was struck with you commenting that you were running a story on hummingbirds because nobody had done anything on that before. But did you know that nobody had done on it, anything on it because somebody pitched the idea to you? Or did you kind of research that yourself and realise that it was an under-reported story? And I had a question um, in terms of narrative, the link between the written word and visual images. So how do you decide how to select visual images, and especially in wildlife crime, visual images can be extremely powerful and can demonstrate, um, um, demonstrate ideas and communicate with the reader in a way that the text um, doesn't. So what do you see as that uh, relationship between the text and the image and communicating these stories? Okay, Rachel, would you like to start? Maybe? Sure. So the hummingbird story actually came from one of our regular freelancers. She um, has made it her mission to find uh, weird wildlife crime stories that nobody's told before. And so she just spends a lot of time Googling things. <laughs> um, and that, that's where hummingbirds came from. I think um, she had, that came from, she had read an interview or maybe it was a published article from um, a forensic ornithologist in the U.S. named Pepper Trail, who those of you who know him uh, know he knows all kinds of weird little things. Um, and so when she brought that to us, and we realized, hey, we've never heard of this before, and my team all follows it pretty closely, um, so that sounded interesting. And then, um, you know, she before she pitched us, she had done her own literature review and was able to say. We, like, I couldn't find any, you know, major media coverage of this in the English language. I'll try to talk. Can I see any, any comments, particularly on the use of images? Okay. Uh, if you look at this piece example, uh, we decided to come uh, with visual and narrative. Uh, it was a new experience for us. Oxpecker, Pulitzer. We came with data, uh, then... Uh, uh, geo, geo journalism. We also came with drone journalism in order to highlight about what was happening there. Uh, the narrative side was always finished. But then, uh, uh, as I remember, Fiona came to me and said, This story we're not going to publish. She said, Is something missing? The visual side, not only in terms of photos, but also video. I was not aware about the result which we were going to get from it that this is what happened. So we are taking consideration the visual and the narrative. Um, I, I, uh, on, maybe on story selection, um, I mean, there's, there's just a huge churn. Every morning you turn up, you, you check your inbox, and there'll be, uh, there, there's certain organizations that share the latest research, what new papers are gonna be released in the next day or two. Um, there's, there's different NGOs um, who, who will send you press releases. Um, and, and, and then you, you trawl other papers. Um, uh, uh, Twitter, I rely on my Twitter feed quite a lot. Um, and, and contacts on the ground. Um, so, I mean, a lot of stuff is coming from, from yeah, people pushing stuff on you. Um, but occasionally, um, you know, I, th I think when you have certain experiences, you can kind of put them together in a way that maybe others haven't done. For example, um, you know, I, I was based in China, 
now I'm um, an environment writer in, in The Guardian, um, and you see something like Belt and Road, the big Belt and Road project coming up, and you just think, well, what's the environmental impact of that going to be? Um, and so then it's you going out. So it, it's, it's probably like all of you, you're just getting bombarded with information all the time, and you're just kind of having to filter it. That's one of the fun things about being a journalist is you just get curious about something and then it's your job to spend some time looking at it and figuring out if there's a story. Yeah, basically being a journalist, I would say, is being a nosy bastard who likes gossip <laughs> and likes putting a finger on where that gossip has come from. We can probably squeeze in <laughs> one more quick question. One question. One more. Yep. Okay. The gentleman there. Yep. Quick question and then three quick, very quick answers. I'm James from Kenya. Uh, my question is, uh, I was actually in a plea to see as, uh, and this as a geological site of London is, let's talk about wildlife. So I'm, uh, I'm of request also to uh, communities to be considered. Reason is um, once the community get direct benefit, they will do two things. One, they will open more space for wildlife to roam, and we will also be in position to end illegal wildlife trade. So uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, finding this, so how do we need also to, co to, to consider about how do community benefit? Okay. So, uh, miss community benefit? Yeah, uh, I'll, 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 I'll chip in. Uh, uh, just, I, I think uh, for the, the, the question is, you know, how, how do you give benefits or, or support for communities or help community livelihoods grow so there's no need for them to be involved in wildlife trafficking or that they can help in, in countering uh, wildlife trafficking? So there's, I guess, a community-based approach. Um, I, I think it's crucial. Um, uh, I, I, I was um, in the Amazon um, uh, two weeks ago and there was a, a very good um, Brazilian NGO there called, uh, the initials is ESA, this uh, socio-environmental institute. Um, and, you know, for many, their, their approach is, is, is totally community-based and they try to protect the rainforests and other species by helping um, indigenous and Quilombolo and uh, riverine communities um, by giving them alternative forms of livelihood. So they, they spend a lot of investment in building, for instance, the Brazil nut industry, and that encourages local communities to protect castanha trees. And once you protect a castanha tree, they're huge. You have to protect uh, like 10 meters around it. I, I, I can't remember the exact number, but a, a significant area around it. So that's their focus. So I, I, I think it's, yes, it's absolutely essential and can make a real difference. I think we'll have to stop there. So oh, I'm can... sorry, too, too long. You no, no, it's okay. Uh, thank you very, very much. I think it's been very, very useful. I would make one final comment to, to repeat the aphorism from an American journalist in the 1920s. The job of the journalist is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> and on that, thank you very much. <coughs>
also, I'd also like to, to extend on behalf of the organizing committee a, a special thanks to Laura and to Matt uh, for their, if you please can join us, for, for all of their help organizing the logistics. The other thing that makes this, this, this event a little bit unique is that there have been a hell of a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Uh, and and that, that certainly made their job uh, none the easier. But also, I think, speaks to, to what we're trying to do, and it's really important. Uh, so at this stage, I know you'd like me to be brief. Uh, I hope that you're feeling enriched, exhausted, uh, but, but not satisfied. There's a, there's a hell of a lot of work left to do. Uh, wildlife trade, illegal wildlife trade, unsustainable wildlife trade is an incredibly intense and targeted threat to global biodiversity, but it's also an area for very important, uh, clear, and, and, uh, and targeted conservation gains. I'd argue that uh, regardless, of, you know, regardless of the diversity in the room, there's some very basic things that we can agree on. And that's that we have a deep concern and a deep passion for the species, the community, the, the spaces and the systems that we're working to, to protect and sustainably manage. And the other is in a sincere interest in the evidence bases that underpin the quality of our interventions. That's uncontroversial. But I hope that today has also required us to address with some slightly more challenging issues when we're talking about illegal wildlife trade. The first involves our receptiveness to, to other ideas. Uh, Ideas that might conflict with our worldviews, our expectations of what does and doesn't work, our species preferences, uh, our, our preconceptions, for example, and, and you know that, that, that has really crossed, I think, across a lot of the different workshops and panels today. Whether it's our deeply held views regarding the militarization of conservation, or sustainable use of wildlife as a strategy for conservation, or as I mentioned, certain species biases about what should or shouldn't be on the agenda. Whether it's about gender norms in conservation in our field, uh, whether it's about the acceptability or viability of certain technologies. We all have, again, preconceptions about, about what does and doesn't work. And we come with our own baggage. And reconciling that baggage with our shared interest in conservation and with our commitment to that evidence basis is, is a considerable challenge. And that may sound like a, that may be a bit of a truism, but I think that it also requires some introspective work to acknowledge what our baggage is, acknowledge the views that we listen to and the views that we exclude, uh, often including the, the views and the voices of, of communities that are not typically represented in these types of fora. So I hope that the panels and workshops today have challenged you to do a little bit of that introspective work. I know that it's, for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge, and I think it's also an evolution as individuals, because what we need is not just more conservation, right? What we also need is, is more reflective work about how we collaborate with one another and what, what we think will and won't work, which at some point requires us to, to acknowledge that th things we thought worked, things we did like, perhaps aren't the right things to be doing. The second challenge has to do with uh, how we make ourselves even more relevant as journalists, as scientists, as practitioners. Many of us are involved in, in different roles in the co-production of this evidence basis that, that we've been talking about. But few of us are naive enough to think that good science or good journalism is going to make good policy or good practice, right? And few of us are going to be complacent enough, hopefully, to accept that our research or our articles should just languish in journals and newspapers. How we strive to not only make our research more robust, which is the typical focus of a conservation conference, but also more meaningful and more relevant, that's what we've hopefully started to make some dent in. You know, I, I care about orchids and I like to do research on orchids, but I increasingly cannot with good conscience do orchid research without being an advocate for them. Now, we talked and we heard about, not only from our journalist colleagues, but even in the openings this morning, what being an advocate looks like is, a, is incredibly variable. It's incredibly normative, and it's going to vary from individual to individual. But the, idea, the, the reality is that we can't be complacent. We at least have to be asking ourselves those questions. What is happening with, the, with our work, and what, what are we doing with it? Because there's no handbook, there's no guide, there's no industry norm to tell us what that is going to look like in practice. 
Yet that question, how we translate the work that we're doing day to day into something that matters on the ground, that's what, that's what conservation is, regardless of which approach you bring to it, which field you come from. I hope we've made some small progress on that today, not only in terms of the topics that we've discussed, but hopefully the diversity of, of people that are, that are in the room. And so with that, you know, again, this, isn't, this is not a traditional academic conference, and, and for good reason, and I hope it hasn't come across that way. I hope, I hope there has been something additional. But like all good academic conferences, it does end with a drink. <laughs> and uh, so I hope that we can take this opportunity to get to know some other people, to help us bridge the gap, come, come pitch these folks a story, uh, come speak with uh, the many community representatives that are here, chat with someone who's working on a different taxa, uh, and, and let's, let's, let's end, uh, let's end uh, to good effect, but also with something future planning. What, what comes next, I think, is always the question in conservation, because even though it's a deeply sobering field, as, you know, as EJ, often, as conservation optimism tells us, it's also a deeply optimistic field, because even the most, uh, you know, uh, jaded conservationist in the room is here. And I think that that says something about the optimism <laughs> in our field. No, we keep, on, we, keep, we keep on trying. But of course, the important thing is not trying the same things over and over and expecting different outcomes. But in fact, looking at our evidence bases, working with our colleagues, and trying some different things. Uh, drinks this evening are in the Prince Albert Suite, which is where we had lunch and coffee. And a brief announcement for the community representatives, there's going to be a photograph. So if you can please meet just in the front lobby before you go get your drink. And I think those are the, all, all the announcements. So on behalf of the organizing committee, thank you again. <laughs>